So let's shift over to what I would like to cover is the mindset operating system. We're gonna learn about the mindset, what it is, how it was created, how it operates, and what can you do to reach peak performance. Everybody has some sense of where they wanna go, where they wanna be, how they wanna close the quarter, what are you gonna do the next day or the next week. And uh, on our way to our goals, we have barriers. And those are mindset barriers. And when I interviewed the, all those amazing people over the past four decades, uh, billionaires like uh, Richard Branson or Mark Cuban or Michael Dell or, or Mark Benioff, they all have a mindset that is wired differently. They are functioning optimally. Essentially, the goal of a peak performer is to achieve optimal cognitive, emotional, and physical functioning. I've come to the realization that 80% of success is breaking through the mental barriers. The question now is that I submit to you, what are the barriers that you see uh, for peak performance? Uh, I think some of the, the mental barriers that, that I see with, with the students and the people that I work with <clears throat> is there, I think with a lot of stuff going on right now, Gerhard, there, there's, a, there's a tremendous adverse uh, perception of change and they don't want to learn how to do things differently. And I, and I find myself <clears throat> falling into somewhat of a complacency model where, you know, do, do I keep teaching stuff the way I've been teaching or do I need to make this change? And, and I want to make the change. I know there's a, a need for it, but oftentimes the, depending on the, the group that we're working with, they're not really open to change. And so I've got, I've got to get that mental block out of my mind that, that there is a need for what we're doing. And, and by we, I mean collectively a, a sales training consulting family <clears throat> that they're, they're, we need to be talking to people about new and better ways to do things and not keep relying on the old stuff. Uh, so that, that's a mental block, that's a mindset block for me. And I've got to make that pivot into a, into a new environment. Right, who can relate to that? Pretty much everybody or? Uh... And I think the biggest one is whether you're conscious or not or unconscious of it is uh, self beliefs, uh, how you see yourself in relation to the world, uh, how you or what you believe uh, of yourself. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a conscious or unconscious mindset that's, um, actually to bring mindfulness into it can expose the fallacy of it so you know from a very tiny age you know we're raised in a certain way to believe a certain way and our social setting influences us in a certain way and it all creates a feeling of how we are safe in the world or what's our what's our place in the world and i think part of what you're teaching and the reason I'm like mindfulness is it it allows you to see that it's uh, it's not true, basically, and so you can shed it more clearly. Right, right. And on, then that taps uh, this this wealth of whatever is there for you to to be a peak performer. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to think about it. Uh, another way to to think about it is um, our relationship to the world is really a reflection of our relationship to ourselves. And, and that's exactly what you said. That's, that's what you get uh, very early on. Um, and um, what, the way I look at it is, and what we have experienced in the last hour, is we did an exercise where we tried to focus on just one thing, on breathing and counting. Uh, how simple is that? and how, how much we struggled with it. And the reason we are struggling is, what inhibits our performance is, we experience too many thoughts. We are exposed to too much information. And, uh, and we live in this uh, age where we, um, I don't know whether Alexis mentioned that, but I remember last time uh, she gave to her presentation, she mentions about that, every hour we get uh, more information than what we could read in, in like 50 newspapers. It's, um, 
you know, times have, have changed fundamentally and, and there's an acceleration of self-talk. Uh, we experience about 60,000 thoughts a day. And that's a research by the National Science Foundation, which is incredible when you think about um, that thought volume that is in response to either internal impulses or external uh, experiences. And here's the kicker. 80% of our thoughts are negative. So our brain is really wired in a way that we look at the negatives first. Uh, we look at the danger. And, uh, and that's why uh, you know, we need a different mindset. We can shift our mindset. So when you look at the, th the thoughts that go through your mind, you know, you wonder how is that going to impact your productivity or your creativity? Um, and how is that going to impact your performance? So the question is, how do you eliminate negative self-talk? Everybody knows it exists. So Uma, what, uh, what, what's your self-talk vo volume today? I was doing the self-talk exercise with a group of CEOs. There was like 21 of them there. And I asked them to write down on three by five cards what their favorite self-sabotaging thought is that kind of, uh -huh. and collect all the cards, shuffle them up, hand them back out. And it, they read each other's thoughts when it allowed them to realize that we all have these negative thoughts, not just me. But the thing that kind of blew me away was, uh, this woman came up to me afterwards, one of the CEOs, and she said, Umar, uh, John doesn't know this, but he read my inner thought that I'm worthless and I won't amount to much. And as soon as he said that, all I wanted to do was to go there and hug him, but I can't do that for myself. Wow. So yeah, we got compassion for others. We need compassion for ourselves. If we cut ourselves the breaks we do for others, we'd be uh, much happier and much more productive. So now, still the question is, how do you eliminate that negative self-talk? So my favorite technique is very much, uh, so if I had a thought, uh, I'm not lovable, which can crush you, just have three counter examples ready. But Gerhardt loves me. My Kat thinks I'm amazing. And as soon as you give back one or two counter examples, that negative thought just goes away. If you're making stuff up, it won't. But if they're true statements, then that negative thought basically gets out of your head, at least for the day. And so you know what your thought is, just come up with three counter examples and have them ready to fire off anytime that thought comes near you. That's a good idea. I like that. I think there are three types of self-talk. And uh, the first type is what I call the floater. You know, there are thoughts floating through your mind. And let's say you're in the middle of a, a, a phone call. All of a sudden, you get a thought where you say, I may not get that sale. That may interfere with your concentration, and that may not. Floaters are, you know, common random thoughts that may not, may not be complete thoughts. There may be fragments of th thoughts. Uh, the next is the dragger, where you have a thought that, that lingers around, that, that uh, holds you back, that where you, you think that something bad may happen or may not happen. So that thought really has emotional consequences that in, can lower your performance. The next one is what I would call the sticker, and that is that negative label uh, where you identify with that thought. Like you lost a sale, and then you say, I'm a loser, or make a mistake and say, I never get anything right. Those stickers, they require a different treatment. They're different from the floaters or draggers because they are permanently placed and they need to be removed. And the way to think about it, when you look at you suck and I'm awesome, you can imagine you have like uh, somebody on your left shoulder, which is your inner critic. And the inner critic says, you suck. On the right shoulder, you have the inner champion that says, you're awesome, you can do it. Your mindset challenge is to recognize that sticker and get rid of that inner critic or lower the voice of the inner critic or challenge that inner critic. 
you know, what is the advantage of thinking that I suck? There's no advantage. What is the evidence that I have that I suck? I don't have any evidence. So is there a different way to think about that? Of course there is. I can do better. I can win. I have all the qualities I need to succeed. And everything I need to succeed is within me now. The big idea is you can edit your self-talk. You can realistically appraise what's going on. Self-talk can sometimes, as Uma said, lead to beliefs. And beliefs turn into behaviors and behaviors turn into action and action turn to result. And by reverse engineering and have more positive self-talk, you will be able to perform better. Here's the example. I'm not good with calling on C-level executives. That would be a practical example. How would you how would you handle that? I would say, why don't I think I'm good at it? You know, and you can use it for coaching your salespeople. It, it's not just for yourself. It's uh, you, you want to go through a, a certain Socratic method where uh, you ask people, what evidence do you have that you are not good at uh, calling on C-level executives? Or how is this helping you sell? How is that helping you win? And uh, what would you do if you couldn't fail? Is there a different behavior you can think of? And uh, what can you do to solve the problem? Let me, uh, may I ask a question? Yes. So let's say someone's got this thought in the head. They're not good at talking to or calling on C-level executives. That makes them nervous. That makes their performance lower. And they start collecting evidence. Sure enough, no one wants to talk to me and I really suck at it. So when you ask that question, how true is that? At that moment, it may be quite true. So what do you do when the evidence actually supports what you're, because it's a, it's a loop, right? Yeah, it is a loop, but um, remember the basics. Um, um, success is all about the right mindset, the right skill set, and the right tool set. So by changing any one of those, um, those, those three elements, you got to make progress. So. Um, there is a skill involved in calling on C-level executives. And, uh, and once you learn a little bit more on how others do it, uh, get a mentor, have a dialogue with a peer who is really, really good with C uh, calling on C-level executives. Um, I remember I uh, recorded once a, a, C a CD, a learning CD with Jeffrey Gittimer, where we talked about that, that topic. And uh, Gidema likes to focus on skills. He likes to drill skills. So you know the basics. And, uh, but you, you can come from the mindset side uh, and say, I'm really curious about improving my skills. And uh, I want to ask better questions. Because if you ask yourself the same question over and over, you n never get out of that negative feedback loop. And I'm gonna explain it in a, in a different way as we talk about the evolution of the mindset. So there are many different ways to get out of that negative feedback loop. Another way to think about uh, that negative self-talk is in terms of time zones. Um, where are you right now? Are you in the past, in the present, or in the future. There is a negative side of the past and a positive. There's a negative side in the present and there's a positive and there's a negative side in the future. What does your mind focus on? Do you focus on the history channel? Are you tuned into CNN? Or are you focused on the sci-fi channel? So by thinking about that, you know, I, I suck at uh, calling on C-level executives. Um, has it always been like that? Is it just that you haven't had enough at-bats with calling on C-level executives? Now, can you dig into the past where you have been successful in interacting and communicating with uh, people that are at a higher level than you are? What positive experiences have you had in the past? And Uma, you know it better than anybody else that uh, in the past there is a rich a treasure chest of histories and stories and information that can help you in the present moment. I think going back to the Alexis's exercise, 
one of the whole points is living in the present moment and living in it in a positive way. And that little exercise three times a day will keep you, it will change your present channel to be a more positive one where you're looking at what you want to create. And if you added in what she was talking about, what are the three things I want to create today? No one's going to say, I want to screw up on a sales call as one of the things you want to accomplish today. So you almost force that future channel to be a more positive one for you. So yeah, I think it all ties well together and your mindset determines how you see the present, the future, the past. Uh, and uh, I think that's our final frontier. That's why I'm so excited to be here uh, uh on this project here yeah, the thing about meditation and mindfulness is it lets you see you know it lets you see your thinking patterns and you can because you can get the tiniest bit of space from them you can just see them kind of as old habitual patterns it's kind of the grooves that uh, alexis was talking about and by being able to detach from them a little bit they don't have the same gravitas or force uh, of how you feel about things because you see them really just as habit, thought habit. That's what they call it in uh, Buddhism. It's just thought habit. And you get a little distance from it and then it just doesn't, you don't identify with it as much and it doesn't influence you as much. So in addition to all the things that you're talking about, the mindfulness create, like, creates a little bit more of a fertile ground for all the things you're talking about to, to take hold and help yeah it's a it's a it's a good, very very good point this is something that what i'd like you to do uh, write this down write down three positive events from your past and uh that should be a homework exercise and then we're gonna get back to that next week but i want to move on maybe Uma, it would be a good idea to to do a, an anchoring exercise where everybody really gets the point where you create new neural pathways um, where you take an experience from the past and uh, anchor it with a movement. Mm -hmm. and so you want to get everyone to write down three positive events from the past first, because that'll give us the data we need to go do that. Yeah, let's do that. And, and think about those three positive events, not so much that they're just positive, but think about events that made you feel freaking fantastic. It's like, oh my God, I remember when I caught that touchdown pass, or I remember when my wife said yes to the first date or whatever that thing is for you three of those where you just felt unstoppable powerful loved whatever that is for you find those three events and then let's do something amazing with them all right let's do it so why, why don't we um start with jerome well i think the uh the the first and foremost event in my life that that i that i felt great about and still feel great about was when i was saved when i accepted jesus and that's that's always been a, a big part of my life, and and I feel like that um, that when when it comes to setting goals and, and achieving the things that I want out of life, uh, I always look to him for leadership and guidance. So that that's always been a a very positive part of my life, and continues to be uh, today. I think my uh, my second one was when I got married, when I when I proposed to my wife and we got married. That's that has been uh, the best twenty years of my life, I have to say, uh, going on twenty one here at the end of this year. Um, and then my third was, I guess, a little more personal thing. I, uh, I completed a, a PhD, a PhD in marketing and sales last year at the ripe old age of 57, which is not normal uh, for people in the world of education. But that was, uh, that was a task that I had devoted a lot of time to, and, and I felt a, uh, a great sense of accomplishment when I completed that. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. Does anybody else want to share? Every time I'm with my grandchildren. I mean, nothing beats that feeling for me. So pure, pure joy. happiness and love and joy and connectedness. So, you know, that's my number one. Uh, Jonathan, I'm going to pick up on that. Um, last week, we've had th uh, three team members come back because they've gone out on maternity leave or parental leave. And on this happy hour, there were three fresh baby faces mm. on the call. And mm. it just was like, oh great, this is the future of the business. Cause these parents are now new parents and they're all excited. It's just, there's, it um, makes the hair on my arms stand up. It's just- I, I'm getting uh, hair on my arms just- yeah, The purity of children and the excitement they have and the, the way that parents interact with them is just, it's a joy to see. We've all had the experience of uh, hearing a song on the radio 
and you get transported back to maybe going to the beach junior high and your significant other has to like touch you on the shoulder, say hello. And you're like, no, I remember junior high. It's like, oh my God, I was back in junior high. It's almost like a reliving. So it's something we do naturally and unconsciously. And what I'm about to show you is a way to do that very thing in a very conscious manner. And think of one of those uh, events that you're thinking about so for Jonathan, it wouldn't be when I'm with my grandchildren, you'd have to think about this last Sunday. So think of a very specific event so you can actually get the juice of the feeling. So if we use generalities, we don't get it. So if everyone's got a specific event where you felt that amazing feeling, all you need to do is to first think of the feeling you want and you got the event with the feeling already covered. The second thing is to figure out where the target is. And I'm going to get you to make a fist and on your index knuckle is where we're going to install that feeling. So anytime you want, you can actually press that and you'll release the feeling instantly without having to do anything. So everyone's got a target, go index finger, knuckle here. I'll get a little closer. The reason we make a fist is it's easy to see where that knuckle is. So it's not a generality. It's a very specific event or place geography. So all you need to do is this is take a deep breath in. Let it out slowly and go back to that specific memory where you felt amazing. And when you go back there, I want you to see what you saw back then. And as you see what you saw back then, the feeling starts to come back and then you hear what have you heard back then. What they were saying, what you were saying, music in the background, silence, whatever was there, hear it now. When you do those two simple things, saw what you saw back then and hear what you heard back then, you start feeling that feeling in your body which is really pleasant. And now I want you to imagine there's a volume control that you could turn that feeling up. And if you increase that feeling, it starts getting larger and bigger and just make it bigger and bigger and bigger. So you feel it throughout your entire body when it feels really strong, press your knuckle with, with one of your fingers firmly for three seconds and then let go and then crank that volume up on the feeling so it gets stronger. See what you saw, hear what you heard back then crank up the feeling some more, hit the knuckle again. And then one last time, crank up the feeling, see what you saw back then, hear what you heard back then, crank up the feeling and lock it in. And when you do that, you've installed a feeling that you just press that knuckle anytime you want. We'll test it in a minute, but I'll tell you a quick story. I had this uh, mother bringing her daughter who's 11 years old and she still has her blankie. And the parents have tried threatening her, hiding it, bribing her, nothing will make her let go of that blanket. So she comes in and I go, okay, pick up the blanket. How do you feel? Oh, I feel safe. Really good. I say, great. Put down the blanket for a minute and think of a time where you felt absolutely fantastic. She goes, well, when, when we were playing lacrosse, I scored the winning goal three months ago and all the other little girls, she was 11, lifted me up above their shoulders and that felt fantastic. I said, I took her through the same exercise, linked it to her knuckle, and then I said, okay, do me a favor, pick up the blanket, see how that feels. Now press the knuckle, see how that feels. Do you need the blanket anymore? She goes, nope. And just left it at my office and went. So all you have to do is think of being stuck in the traffic and being late for an appointment for a moment. So you get that negative feeling, take a deep breath, let it go, and then press the knuckle. And as soon as you start feeling the amazing feeling, say, yeah. It's there, right? Think of the audacity of what we're doing there. The only way you can feel that feeling, Jonathan, when your grandchildren are there is if you release the right chemicals in your brain. Certainly they're the ones doing it, but you have to release that chemical cocktail to feel that exact emotion. And what we did was show you how to get your brain to release that exact cocktail anytime you want. So I'll give you one last piece of advice before I turn it back to Gerhard is when my wife was talking about things that were important to her, sometimes not as important to me. So I actually thought of a time I was super focused and paying attention to something I was interested in. And I just linked it to my baby knuckle. And anytime she wanted to talk about something that was interesting to her, I would just click that and it would change the brain chemistry to be highly focused. And she would feel attended to, and I saved my marriage. Awesome. Let's, let's go back to, um, um a different way of thinking about the mindset operating system. At the core of everything is a narrative. And the narrative is the story you tell yourself that's 
explains the experience that you have had. Our minds constantly try to seek meaning. Um, they, uh, our mind tries to make sense. That narrative translates into beliefs and behaviors. And those behaviors lead to actions and the action leads to results. Here's the magic. There is something when we grow up where, you know, when you look at a, a three-year-old, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, every month they, they have a new mindset. They have a new way of looking at the world. And, uh, and they cannot put things in perspective yet. They haven't figured out on how life works. And yet the experiences that their mind translates into a belief system is not fully formed like an adult. So the beliefs that we form as children up until maybe 12 years are all subject, subject to limitations because the brain has not been fully functioning. I, I want to explain it in a different way. The, the mindset operating system, whenever there is an event, you have thoughts and feelings. And those feelings and thoughts translate into a narrative, a story. And the story of you is not always true. And that um, narrative then leads to beliefs and the beliefs lead to behaviors and behaviors lead to results. A lot of people in sales, they say, well, you're not behaving right. You got to change your behavior and, and then you're going to get better. Or I going to give you some success secrets. You apply those secrets and you're going to get better. And that is not working. Uh, no matter how much time you spend uh, with salespeople, it's very hard to change behaviors or beliefs until you challenge the narrative. And that's where the magic happens. That's where, where peak performers, they think differently because their narrative is different. It's more adapted to reality. It's more focused on their goals. So everybody has a prefrontal cortex. That's the inner CEO. And 95% of our brain activity is unconscious and 5% is conscious. Prefrontal cortex is your ability to think about thinking. You're aware of your thoughts. Uh, you, you can interpret those thoughts uh, and you can shape that narrative and you can edit the narrative so you can reach your goal. And if you retain nothing else about this mindset operating system, but that one word narrative, your story, I think we're going to make a lot of progress. I want to share with you how that narrative and how that belief leads to different selling styles and different results. If somebody has the belief that selling is a transaction, that's the level one mindset. People are driven to close and their mindset says either you sell, you're being sold, prospects are all targets. And that's the kind of thinking that, uh, leads to transactional sales that are not very satisfying, that are not very effective. And the behaviors are obvious. They're caricatures of a sales professional. They talk too much. They don't listen enough. They use high pressure. So that's a level one mindset. The level two mindset is the relationship mindset. And everybody says, well, we need to create a relationship and relationships are everything. And those people are driven to bond and they're positive about people. They are nice to everybody. Uh, they believe that relationships are the key factor. And there's a downside to relationship uh, focused selling, which is if I'm not liked, I'm a failure. And there's a study by Dave Curlin, uh, Objective Management Group, where um, he says that uh, people with a high need for approval they are not good performers. Um, and out of the 2 million people that he has tested, uh, when he looks at the top performers, only 11% of top performers have a high need for approval, whereas 87% of the bottom performers have a high need for approval. So relationship belief model is not as effective as you could be. So. 
uh, you avoid challenging customers, you avoid asking, do you have the budget? You avoid asking, is there anybody else besides you involved in making the decision? And there's a better way, which is the value seller. They focus on ROI. They believe that selling is all about creating value. They believe that solving a problem, or identifying a pain is the key to selling. Uh, asking the right question leads to the right solution. That's another, you know, their, their belief that selling is about the diagnostic. And their behaviors are diagnostic skills, their solve business problems, and they know how to differentiate themselves. So those are the, the three basic uh, belief systems that salespeople either have developed on their own or through training. And, uh, and there's another level, which is the, part, the strategic partner. And that obviously is the highest level. Uh, they, uh, those salespeople believe that they're a business improvement catalyst. Uh, they know that the trusted partner wins and they create massive value. They leverage all the support systems within the company and uh, they're top performers. They're customer advocates. They get a lot of repeat business. So that's the, that's the reason why we talk about the mindset operating system because you, you cannot change behaviors. You wanna look at the beliefs because the beliefs drive the action. Now I gotta to come to the mindset foundation, an explanation how your mindset was formed. And there are three levels. The implanted mindset, is whatever you learn from your parents. So you think about your mindset like as a garden that has rocks and flowers, that has weeds, and your job is to uh, continue to water the flowers and stop watering the weeds. So when we talked earlier about what time zone do you live in, you know, the past, the present or the future, a lot of people are living in the past. They're living in that, in that garden where they don't look at the flowers, they just look at the rocks and they look at the weeds and they say, poor me. And, uh, and there are ways to change that and go beyond that. The next level is the imprinted mindset. And that is what we learn from teachers and mentors uh, when we get older, when we are uh, get our feet wet and uh, get along in the world, socialize. And uh, some people uh, get wonderful exposure to people like Jerome, you know, who's a, a teacher and you uh, expand people's minds. And imprinted means that you're impressed with somebody and you look at heroes. You say, I want to be like that. Um, and then you work towards that goal. And the last level, the highest level is the inspired mindset. And that is your inner voice. And the, uh, that inspired mindset reminds me um, of um, Mary Kay Ash. She said, I believe that everybody is born with an instrument. And so many people die with their music still unplayed. And our job in life is to find out what is that instrument and then learn how to play it. Another way to look at this um, implanted, in, imprinted and inspired mindset is that implanted mindset is, is limited. The job of your parents and caretakers is to set boundaries, to set limits what you can do and what, what you can't do. The imprinted mindset is all about expansion and enhancement. Um, that's why you look out for mentors or teachers. Uh, you wanna learn more uh, and, and grow on the base that your parents have created. So think about the implanted is limited. The imprinted is expansion, but the inspired mindset is a world without limits where everything is possible. And uh, a lot of uh, people think that what their parents gave them was the limit and that's all they can achieve. 
Um, and I can give you example after example of people who have gone through our mindset training have said that my role is not to be either like my parents or like my father, or like my mother, but be myself and grow to the highest level of functioning and not be a carbon copy or maybe the opposite, but be your true self. And I remember when I interviewed uh, Bill McDermott, you know, he had, uh, um, he's the CEO of ServiceNow. It was formerly the CEO of SAP. And uh, he talked about the inspired mindset and said, everybody has inner magic. And your role as a leader is to recognize that inner magic is in everybody and it takes one to know one. And you want to awaken that inner magic. You, you want to help them believe in their inner champion. And I say that your mindset creates your destiny. This is fresh thinking. This just uh, came out because we are doing this online training and I want to do something dramatically new. And uh, I want you to think about what zone do you live in or what zone do your salespeople live in? There are three zones, the fog zone, and that's the zone where people are consumed by anxiety, self-pity, depression, high stress and anger, all negative emotions that people absorb automatically when they consume the news. You know, you spend an hour on CNN uh, or on scanning the headlines and your mind will be in a fog. And uh, the second zone is the comfort zone. Everybody wants to be comfortable and feel comfortable where people are relaxed, chill, content, satisfied, and secure. And that's not the peak performance zone. That's the next one uh, where you are focused, you're eager to win, you're motivated, you're driven, you're excited. And that's the growth zone. And your job as leaders is to move people out of the comfort zone into the growth zone and take care of the people that are in the fog zone because the productivity of um, people in the fog zone is 10% of what they're capable of and they're numb. And uh, if you're in the comfort zone, those people are at 50% at best and they're stagnant. And people are in the growth zone, they're flourishing. When you look at what uh, time we live in, we're living in a pandemic, we're living in a time where people are concerned with Black Lives Matter, uh, where the people having uncomfortable conversation and the role of the leader is to restore hope, to be a merchant of hope. Uh, somebody said that 38% um, of the people of Salesforce they have found from internal surveys of 50,000 employees, that 38% suffer from mental health issues. And uh, Mark Benioff said, well, we immediately need to do something about it. And, uh, and those people that have had sort of significant but, but manageable stress, they uh, started to teach mindfulness. I know somebody who is teaching mindfulness as, at uh, Microsoft because they have the same issues. So they, those people are in the fog zone, so they provide mindfulness or meditation training. Uh, they have weekly meetings where they get together and talk about their challenges and their difficulties. That is the, the time we live in. That's what we're dealing with. Everybody wants to be in growth mode and everybody wants to be flourishing. And the recipe is you, you want to fix the fog zone. You want to have a program for that. Uh, you want to get people to live the, leave the comfort zone and stay in the growth zone as long as possible. So I want to open it up for, uh, for questions and comments, and uh, I'd like to, everybody to chime in. Mark. Yeah, so uh, well, I, I, uh, as you mentioned, there was a lot to take in there, but I guess uh, the triangle, the three, the three, uh, you know, from implanted, imprinted, and inspired, I guess that was really uh, used for me um, as far as, you know, what we learned from our parents, guardians, family, as far as like how far we can go, how how we can, you know, achieve in life. So just kind of looking on that and obviously self-reflecting at the same time, there was a big takeaway like, hey, maybe I've been limiting myself, you know, on some of the things that I want to do and achieve, 
even though I know I can, you know, it's still like that subconscious level where it's like, hey, you know, why, 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 why shoot for the skies? I'm good right here. Um, so, and then this, this, this slide that's up right now, the fog zone, comfort zone, you know, growth zone, you know, definitely trying to get away from the comfort zone into the growth zone. Uh, and I actually heard the term I haven't heard before. Uh, someone said, uh, you know, they're uh, retired in place, you know, RIP. Like one of the coworkers was, and I just thought that was like, you know, that was a wild moment. You know, I was like, wow, you know, you're saying that this person is basically all those things that's in this comfort zone right here. You know, they're content, satisfied, secure. So, you know, there's no, there's no motivation to do anything else to, to achieve anything else. It's like, hey, I'm re they're retired in place. So um, just kind of, you know, taking away from that, like you're just moving right in and trying to go move all in into the comfort zone, uh, the flourishing comfort growth zone. And just go all, go after you know just go after everything I want to do. So yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, and there are ways uh, we're gonna dive in deeper. You know what does flourishing really mean, and uh, what what do you need to do? As I said earlier, um, a cognitive intelligence, and there's an emotional intelligence and a physical intelligence at work, and uh, we need to fine tune them. And what we achieved today, I think it was. A, good to pair this up with um, Alexis to become aware of what the mind can produce. And uh, the next level is how can the how we use our mind and manage all those elements more effectively. And I, I'm, I'm glad that it got you to think about the implanted mindset uh, which is the, the limit zone of our mindset. And, uh, and the, the educators uh, like, like Jerome, they know that uh, you can only go so far with expanding on that and, and stretching the boundaries that their parents set. And uh, you know, there, are, there are a lot of people that uh, where their parents had never gone to college and they're the first generation that went to college and they're trailblazers, but uh, uh, they still can do more, and and uh, getting in that no limit zone is is frightening to people. It's scary. Jerome, um, why don't you chime in and and share what what goes through your mind? Yeah, I, I agree with you, Gerhard. It's it's uh, it really is still ironic, even in today's world, uh, at, the, at the higher education level, when we're doing events where we're where they're recruiting and students come to the campus. You know, to look at the possibility of going to school uh, with us starting in the fall. And we have a, a booth set up in this area. And we're talking about, you know, the, the wonderful world of professional selling and the opportunities that are out there for people that want to plug in and engage uh, and what all that can hold for them as they go forward. And then their parents are standing there and they look right at me and say, well, uh, I'm not paying money to send my kid to school to be a salesperson. And that's that, that's that implanted mindset that you're talking about, uh, that they're not willing to accept any new opportunities. And yet the reality of it is, and you, you know the numbers as well as I do, you know, in, in the College of Business, anywhere from 60 to 75% of all graduates, no matter what their degree is in, will start off their career in some type of a sales role. And so, and a lot of these people are going into a sales role with no understanding of what's expected of them in that role. And we're trying to break that mold and yet their parents are still the, the helicopter world. They're, they're trying to keep them in a shell. They want them to, they want them to conform to what they believe they should do and not what the, what the child can actually do. Awesome. I'll tell you, Gerald, what I got from this is um, nice techniques, actual techniques that you can do to help you in your mind, where your mind is. Um, always, you know, being able to delineate. For me, being able to delineate something that may be conscious or unconscious helps me understand how to get through it. Um, you know, as, as I guess you and everybody else can tell by now, my bias is towards mindfulness. Uh, but I can see how mindfulness and the science of things are very compatible with each other and very complimentary towards each other. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it was great. I mean, I have three very tangible things I'm, I'm 
experiencing and taking away with. Well, thank you. We are going to continue next uh, Tuesday at one o'clock. And uh, I'm going to go a little deeper into the mindset operating system. And um, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, also goal setting and uh, how we can achieve the things that we want to achieve and remove some of the internal obstacles. Um, I also recorded this today and uh, I want to create a special channel um, and I send you the link so you can review this. If you have any questions about what we covered today and you want to like to get more information or research or whatever um, question you may have, send me an email. I'm happy to respond to anybody and everybody. Mm -hmm.